Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the Doctors. Of course, Dr. G is sharing one of her favorite teas. I am sipping on Arizona iced tea. When we return, we will be discussing African Americans in law enforcement. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the Doctors. Of course, I have to introduce my wonderful co-host. Good evening, Dr. Singleton. How are you? Good evening. What's up, Dr. G? Hey, hey, hey. Hey, how Dr. Doing? Smith, how are you? I am wonderful. Awesome. So this evening, we will be discussing African Americans in law enforcement, and we are honored to have two awesome chiefs of police. So I would like to introduce first the chief of police from the city of East St. Louis, Chief Perry. Welcome to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the doctors. Welcome, thank you for having me. And I would also like to introduce to you all Chief McCall, and he's the chief of police for the city of Ferguson. Welcome to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the doctors. Thank you very much. Chief Perry, I would like to start with you. What made you want to go into law enforcement? Well, um, law enforcement started with my father, who was a uh, St. Clair County Deputy Sheriff for 29 years. I then went off to the University of Arkansas, studying criminal justice, came back and um, proceed, received my master's degree at Lindenwood in criminal justice administration. And from there, I just went on to continue on with law enforcement. It's always been a passion of mine. Okay, awesome. Okay, and what about you, <coughs> Chief McCall? Well, really, I didn't know. Okay. Coming up in Chicago, that's where I grew up. And um, I um, went to SAU Edwardsville, left school, joined the Marine Corps. And I was an MP. And uh, you know, as kids, you talk about being the police. So I became an MP, and a lot of people told me I was pretty good at it. You know, so when I did get out of the Marine Corps, you know, I had a family. So you're looking for something to, that you're familiar with, to bother yourself with. And I was fortunate enough to. Uh, be hired by the city of Berkeley, Missouri, okay. to be a police officer, and here I am now. Awesome, okay. So Dr. Singleton, I'll yield the floor to you sure. so you can ask the chief some sure, questions. Sure, sure. Well, thank you again, uh, uh, Chief Perry, and mm -hmm. also Chief McCall. Um, one of the, uh, what's unique about uh, the, the, the setting we have here uh, is that you both are chief of police of uh, cities that do not always get their uh, due justice, okay? And when I say that, um, I'm born and raised here in the city of East St. Louis, and, and we don't always get our fair shake. You know, there's a lot of negative publicity uh, that comes with uh, being from East St. Louis at times. And, and certainly, uh, Chief McCall, uh, we all can recall several years ago the instances of Michael Brown uh, right in your front door, uh, right in your city. Um, so I want to just throw this question out to both of you all. Um, let, let's start with just talk to me about uh, what you do on a daily basis. Uh, what, what's your daily routine, uh, Chief Perry, in the city of East St. Louis? And then Chief McCall, I'll have you answer the same question, what you do every day in Ferguson. Well, <clears throat> my daily routine starts off in the morning with um, I check my shifts, make sure that we are uh, properly manned, then I go over emails and I go over um, what might have happened the day, night before, the weekend before, or but my main focus right now is um, keeping our summers in control. And to start keeping the summer in control, we had to start in the winter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can't keep the summer control in the summer. All right. All so right. we've been working right now heavy on different protocols for the summer coming up. It's going to be probably one of the first summers coming completely, uh, like I want to say COVID free, but loosening up from the COVID restrictions. So at that time, you got a lot of people that have been locked up for so long. So it's going to be a lot of frustration, a lot of energy release. So we have to make sure that we keep our city maintained. So okay. we're starting from day one yeah. as okay. far as main focus right now is surviving the summer. Okay. Okay. Wow. That's good, Chief. Chief McCall? What he said. No, I'm just <laughs> No, I'm um, seriously. Um, as a police chief, you don't have a regular day. 
typically. Uh, my day typically starts off with the phone ring. You get certain notifications and things like that. So once you, you say get to your office, you get to the station. So like the chief said, you want to make sure that your staffing is adequate for the people of your community. But with Ferguson, we have a consent decree as well. So there are a lot of things, a lot of pieces that are moving at the same time when it comes to us. So I'm charged with ensuring that those pieces keep moving, but they're moving in the right direction. That's involving community engagement, that policy revisions, um, best practices, and different things like that. Um, but also re reaching out to your peers to get ideas and, and, and their opinion on different things. There's one thing about law enforcement that I've learned is that you're not in this by yourself. And your neighboring communities and things of that sort, uh, you communicate with, you share information with, you support and help each other out. So, um, but when it comes to that, you want to make sure your staff is right. But most importantly, you want to make sure that you have all your pieces in, in line to serve that community. Wow. Wow. Let, let me ask this question here. And, and of course, I know my colleagues will chime in. Tell me your biggest challenge, uh, Chief, right now. Uh, in the city of East St. Louis, uh, if, if you could wave a, a wave a magic wand, what? Tell me about some of the challenges or your biggest challenge that you face uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, I think our biggest challenge is going to be pretty much like every law enforcement agency here. Biggest challenge is going to be manpower. The whole world is short of police officers. Crime is going up. Police officers are going down. And when you talk about manpower, you don't want to just pick manpower, so you have to get adequate uh, officers that can come patrol your city so you don't have a lot of issues. Because you want quantity, not quality. I mean, quality, not quantity. Okay. So our biggest issue right now is making sure we keep enough manpower. So we have resources, but when you're short of manpower, it don't matter how many resources you have because you still have to fill up these shifts. You still have to be able to man your streets. And I can't tell somebody, well, we're not going to answer your report because we don't have anybody. That's our job. Mm -hmm. Regardless if it's one or 100 people, <clears throat> we still have a job to do. And my job is to make sure that we have the manpower to do it. And that's our biggest issue right now is getting up to staff. Okay. okay. Chief, what's your biggest challenge in Ferguson? Well, well like the chief said, it's staffing. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I think every agency in the country is short of manpower, some worse off than others. Uh, but to piggyback on that, you still have things that you're tasked to do as police department. Um, in Ferguson, um, I've been chief since July of last year. Um, I was the chief of neighboring Berkeley when the tragic incident occurred in 2014. So, and I've told people in the past, you cannot talk about what your community needs until you have dialogue with your community. Mm. So even though we have a staffing situation, things of that sort, we still have to prioritize with getting with the community, getting input with the community. We have, we're, we're, we're still having our engagements and different things like that. COVID hurt us because we couldn't get out like we wanted to, but at the same time, we still continue by way of Zoom and, and things of that sort. But I think, because we're gonna answer our calls, we have to. That's even if I'm out on the street answering calls, you know. Um, you, you, you do what you have to do, but I think a lot of the challenging thing is that you have to still maintain that communication aspect with the citizens that you're serving because, like I said, they have needs. You he's still under stressful times. You still want to be approachable. So they're comfortable coming to talk to you. And those are things that, if they did exist prior to, where we have to maintain the, or ensure that they continue to exist, but a little more so because we want partnerships as opposed to, it's like, you can't police your community, you police with your community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I like it. Dr. Well, Smith? So, yeah, I have a question. So, um, Chief Perry, yes, you mentioned that your father was in law enforcement. That's correct. So you had a positive <clears throat> role model to look up to as a black man, correct. right? And um, Chief McCall, you mentioned that you wanted to do this early on in your career apparently you had positive influences to help you come to that decision. Now today, you all are faced with people not viewing the police in that positive way that you all were brought up, right? So what do you want people to know about police that could possibly change their mindset 
about helping you staff up for one, and then helping you police as another and not being a threat to society, but helping society. So what could you say to our viewers to break down some of those barriers? Well, I'm gonna tell you the first thing, you know, I'm a realist. <clears throat> I'll tell you this, um, and I challenge anybody to say different, but there's not a juvenile in this area that I can't reach. Mm. And I'm gonna say that to anybody. Wow. I worked in a juvenile transition center for nine years and I was successful there. There's not a kid that I can't reach, but you have to give us a chance. Okay. Okay. I've walked these streets and Dr. Singleton has also walked these same streets. Mm -hmm. I was there. So let me be that role model for you that you didn't have or you don't have now. Wow. So we all, all we're asking is to give us a chance. We don't, we haven't had a bad rap per se, as far as law enforcement. But at the same time, uh, you're gonna have to trust somebody eventually. Mm -hmm. And all I'm asking you to do is give me a chance, just trust me. Okay. And it, it, I'm not gonna fail you, but just give me that chance. Oh yeah, awesome. I believe you too, Chick. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So we are going to take a short break and when we return, we are going to continue this conversation with African Americans in law enforcement. We'll be right back. The sooner you recognize the signs of autism, the sooner you can make a lifetime of difference for your child. Start by answering a few simple questions at screenforautism.org. Welcome back to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the doctors. If you are just tuning in, we are having a conversation with the Chief of Police from East St. Louis, Chief Perry, and the Chief of Police from Ferguson, Chief McCall. So Chief McCall, we'll just pick up right where we left off before the break. Okay, great. Um, basically, I think the one thing that we would need as, as police officers is for people, of course, you, you know, we want people to trust us. We want people to believe what we say and tell them. But in today's society, people are visual, very visual. So, and it's that saying that you can fix your mouth to say anything. Mm -hmm. but, until, but until you show by action that you're sincere in what you're talking about doing, that trust ratio is gonna be hesitant, it's gonna be like a lot of gray areas. So it's just like the chief said, you get out there yourself physically and you communicate and, 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 and you talk, especially to your youth. We all know um, when it comes to role models and things like that, a lot of people sit back and look at you and say, well, that's only him or whatever. We have to be willing and able to go out there and say, but you can do it too. I'm no better than you. You know, and give them the motivation and the support, not just one conversation because you have to follow up and follow up because there's so many distractions in the world today be it by way of social media, be it just things going on in general, you know, within th this country. So we have to be committed. And I think when it comes to the recruitment aspect, um, people are caring, inherent per se. And I say that because everybody has a heart. And, and you see a person down on their luck, you might not say nothing, but you say, oh, wow, that's messed up. To some level, we all care. The thing of it is, is that we have to get back to stuff, you know, at the old school where your neighbor check you if you were messing up and things like that. But then again, our parents need to be able to accept that because a neighbor's helping you. And we've gotten away from that. So I think, to make a long story short, I'm sorry, but I think that go by our actions, that we are sincere. And when it comes to, say, your law enforcement entities, don't just talk about doing something with the youth, then set it up and make it happen you know, then invite everybody, not just one part of town, the whole town, the whole city. And when you do that, they know that you're sincere in what you're doing, but you're not just picking who you want to help, you want to help everybody. You put a big umbrella on it, and you know, you do what you have to do, but you got to be consistent with it. Okay, mm -hmm. so Chief Perry, I, I have a two-part question for both okay. of you all. <clears throat> my first question is, what keeps you motivated? And my second question is, we know that there are a lot of young men who have a fear of the police. What would you say to those young men to help kind of downsize some of that fear? Okay, um, so the first question, what keeps me motivated? That's a very big question because understand one thing, 
Like they always said, if you love your job, you never spend a day at work. Well, I'm sad to say, but I love my job. I like being here. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. That's the only way you're going to succeed is you love what you do. If you give me an everyday drag, like, man, I got to work. And we've had some rough days. I've had some extremely rough days. But at the end of the day, as everybody said, I've conquered 100% of my rough days because I'm still here. Mm -hmm. So that's the first part about it. You got to buy into this and you have to love what you do. If not, you're not going to succeed. Okay. Okay. And as far as what I tell some of these guys out here when they say, well, or you don't trust the police, but you're sitting here trusting somebody else with a gun. You know, you got these guys out here, you, you, you gonna put your faith in criminals or you gonna put your faith in us? Mm -hmm. So it's easy to say, well, you don't trust the police because that's a, um, as I say, a, a trained response. Mm -hmm. You know, my uncle was in jail, my cousin, somebody that, in the back of the day, we've had a lot of issues. But as I say, you gotta trust somebody. Right. And uh, we gain our trust not by saying, but by doing. Mm -hmm. And I was just at Lincoln Middle School yesterday giving a presentation about gun control for the kids there. So I stay in these schools, I stay on these blocks, I stay in these kids' ears, and I can't reach all of them. Right. But one of them is gonna buy into what I'm saying. So even the worst guys that I've gotten, and I got a list in my phone of kids that I've talked to that are in prison, that write me from prison, that call me, and like, man, if I could have just listened to you. I got some that got out, and the first place they come is to my doorbell. They're like, man, I'm out. Mm -hmm. Can you hear, you know, this is what I've learned and all of that. So, you know, prison doesn't end your, your struggle. Right. When you get out, you got to have something to fall on or you're going back. So when they come out, they reach out to me, and I do the best I can to help them. But, you know, we, we all have to get together to do this. So my thing is they, they see what I do. And that's why I've been so, so successful right. with the youth. Okay, okay. Yes. Chief, McCall. Yes, as far as what keeps me motivated, um, I can honestly say that, especially through my tenure at Ferguson um, as a commander and now as chief, my motivation is that I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, basically, um, I was chief next door, like I said before, when everything happened. So when I come to the department and I see what it was when I got there and what it is now, in reference to what we're doing as an agency and as a city, um, the Ferguson Police Department as it stands now is 50% minority. You know, it, it wasn't that in 2014. Um, the Ferguson Police Department as it is now has more female officers than it's ever had in its existence. Wow. Wow. Okay, and so when I, look at that and what has been accomplished during that time frame. And that's from 2016 to present. You know, you know, I'm confident about that. But more importantly, I'm confident in the relationships that have been established in the community. Because when I first got there, it was, I'm not going to listen to you, you're not going to listen to me. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, be it if it's a, a, a telephone call, and an email, a, a phone pop up, people don't want to come to the police station. Mm -hmm. But now they're comfortable coming to the police station. So like I said, I see that light, I see progress as far as what we've been trying to do and success, but I also see progress in the consent decree as well. Mm -hmm. You know, now it's just a point of getting all of the information out so people can, other people can see what we're doing that's positive and things. Um, in reference to our young men fearing the police, um, myself, when I talk to them, you know, I'm going to be straight with them, you, you know. Uh, I realize that in every profession, you might have negative encounters with people of a prominent profession. That can be law enforcement, that can be medical, clergy, it doesn't matter. I mean, I've never witnessed 100% perfection in my life. Well, one, well, I didn't witness it, well, that's Jesus Christ, but I, hope, but I didn't witness that when I'm not that old. But the fact I'm making is this, is, is that so, I, I try to share with them the fact that you're going to have encounters throughout your life. As a police officer, off duty, I've had encounters. I've been stopped, you know, and the first thing I didn't do was I'm the police. No, I didn't say nothing because I was curious. How, how am I going to be treated? Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, and um, you learn from that. But, but the fact is, you let these young men know that 
I'm you, you know? And based on decisions that I made in my life, as far as not to overreact, to do some reading, to do some learning about where I'm at, it's like that saying, know your enemy. Mm -hmm. So if that person is classified as your enemy, the only way you're gonna defeat that enemy is to know that enemy, mm -hmm. you know? But at the same time, if you learn that enemy, you might discover that they're not really an enemy, mm -hmm. you know? So, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm straight with them, but at the same time, then I'm gonna say, hey, it takes two. Mm -hmm. where, where are you coming from? Mm -hmm. Respect begets respect, yeah. Yeah. you know? And just like we mentioned, in this profession as it stands right now, you know, it's a dangerous profession. Mm -hmm. And it's because of how times have changed and the lack of respect and different things of that sort. So I try to make myself accessible to uh, to my community, to, to especially young men, because they're our future, you know, let's be real. And I tell them, right now, we're outnumbered. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, and we're losing young men daily. Mm -hmm. you, you know, so what are we going to do about it? You know, we fear law enforcement, but at the same time, we, we might want to fear some other things that need to be corrected. Mm -hmm. You know, because a lot of stuff that we're doing to ourselves is self-inflicted as well. Mm -hmm. So, as I say, some folks want to hear it, some folks don't want to hear it, but reality is reality. Yeah. And, if, and if they go back and look at the data, mm -hmm. you know, because when you're sharing things, you supply, here, this supports what I'm saying. Right. You right. know, therefore they know that you're just not just running your mouth, mm -hmm. you know. But you give them examples. Mm -hmm. You give them references, things that they can check. You send them to other people that you know because you've had dialogue with other people, mm -hmm. so they know it's not just coming from you. Mm -hmm. That they're not, it's not an isolated incident when it comes to them. So Chief, let, let, me, let me ask this question to both of you, and I'm gonna start with you, uh, Chief McCall. Let me give you 30 seconds to brag on you, okay? Tell me about some of the things that you've accomplished in your short time as Ferguson, maybe it happened in Berkeley, but I want people to get a good feel of you and your leadership style. Uh, Chief Perry, be thinking about the same thing. Some of the things that you are proud of uh, in Ferguson, you know, post Michael Brown. You know, talk about okay. some of the things that you've accomplished. Well, it's like I said, post Michael Brown was getting in a position to have dialogue with the, you know, with the people, with the activists, with, with people who were willing to listen and we could sit across the table and talk to each other. I think that was one of the most important things because then we have a better understanding of each other. And then, then you can tell the level of sincerity because when you're talking to a person, you can look them in the eyes, you know? So I'm, I'm happy with that. Like I said, I'm happy with the progress that has been made. Remember, I was there, got there in 16. I haven't even been chief for a year. Mm. But the thing of it is our progress is continuing. You know, for the time I've been there, there were two chiefs, two permanent chiefs prior to me. You know, and one was stay for two years, the other one was a little under two years, you know. So when you have that kind of transition and change, a lot of times you have to start over and sure. right. that flow gets messed up. Mm -hmm. And and I'll be honest, it's been it's been a lot, you know, yeah. with that flow, but but we're maintaining that flow. Good. And and that's even with staffing, we have more interest as far as young people wanting to come and be a part of our department than what we had prior to. Sure. Um, so I'm happy with that, but I, but I do attribute that to uh, my years as chief of Berkeley, Missouri. Mm -hmm. I attribute that with being afforded the opportunity to uh, go to the FBI National Academy and, and um, graduate from that police executive training. Because people, pe people have to understand when you're dealing with a law enforcement entity, you got to know stuff about structure and organization. Sure. But then when you don't forget where you came from. Mm then you also have to remember and keep that ideal like, hey, we're in this together. Mm -hmm. But I think, I said one of the most important things is to be an example. Awesome. Chief? <clears throat> yeah, well, I wouldn't know where to start. I mean, you're <laughs> from the city of East St. Louis just yes. like I am. We're on a steamroll, man. Yeah. Yeah. We're rolling hard, man. We've had, uh, when I first got there, we was up to almost about 40 uh, fatal incidents in the city. And we're down right now under, tw under in the 20s, yes. we hired about nine new officers. We okay. established about seven or eight juvenile uh, programs for the kids. We got our new PSEG uh, agreement with the state police that ad added another almost 35 detectives aggressively uh, investigating our, our crimes and everything. So uh, we're moving forward with it. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. 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 So stay tuned. We'll be right back, and Dr. Singleton will be sharing the tip of the day. Hey, Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Do clouds take naps? I couldn't tell you. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! Welcome back to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the Doctors. Dr. Singleton, take us out with our tip of the day. Well, Dr. G, thank you. Um, and let me first of all thank the, uh, the panel that has assembled here today. Um, we started out sharing uh, that uh, the, the prominence of this panel. Uh, it's not often that you get uh, chiefs of major cities uh, that have had uh, some, some challenges in the past. And these chiefs are here to share their stories and to share their progress. Uh, and I want to commend you both for taking time out of your schedule uh, to come and talk to uh, Dr. G and the doctors uh, and to share your experiences. So uh, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, and, and so as we conclude this segment, uh, what we heard today was trust. Uh, police officers are human beings just like uh, we all are. Uh, and they have a family to go home to in the evening. And, and I think that's the goal. That's what they want to do. They want to come and serve and, and protect uh, the public, uh, but they also want to go home to their families. And so uh, the things that I've heard uh, uh, both chiefs say are trust in the police. Uh, uh, all police are not bad, okay? We've seen uh, maybe a few bad apples uh, uh, over time, but, but these uh, two chiefs here, uh, are, I know them, I know them personally, uh, and I commend the work that they're doing. And so um, I will leave you with the tip of the day, um, and that is trust in the police officers, trust in the law enforcement. Um, and if there are issues, these are guys that you can sit down and talk to and resolve those issues. So let's make sure that we trust, trust in the police. All righty. Thank you all for tuning in to Talking Tea Time with Dr. G and the doctors, and we will see you all next time. Bye-bye. See you later. online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to start boosting your retirement savings today.